Hi, I'm Angela Eaton, America's Director for SafeCast. I'm here to share some thoughts with you on how people are developing community data assets from personal experience during disaster events. What am I talking about with community or publicly held data assets? People tend to know what their experiences are. Quantifying those experiences allows communities to discuss those realities productively with government, industry, and as a group. So we ask the groups we work with, what questions do you have that environmental data can answer? And how can you take action from that data? With regards to citizen science, it's useful to look at the levels of disaster within orders of effects. First order effects, the immediate danger, preventing loss of life and basic needs for food, shelter, and safety. Second order effects are more social, loss of income and jobs, response to displacement, and effects on groups and places. Third order effects may include long-term experiences of the disaster on a personal and community level. Depending on the disaster, citizen science and community action can be effective at each of these levels. Community science that's in place before a disaster establishes baselines and importantly sets up norms before a disaster strikes, allowing for a volunteer network already knowledgeable about needs and quickly able to respond with the appropriate cultural sensitivity. During and immediately after a disaster, crowdsourced innovation, response, and data collection can be faster and more responsive than traditional means. Though we found that oftentimes the enduring parts of an emergency are not always obvious when a disaster first strikes. For instance, during the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, hundreds of citizen science groups formed around solving the problem of not having enough ventilators. Almost all of these groups designed for 3D printing of PPE are gone. That is because the needs changed quickly to testing and preventing community transmission, which have shown to be better handled through a combination of policy and guidance from government and academic science. Responding to the second and third order effects that emerge even as a disaster is still happening can have a significant role for citizen scientists and communities looking to collect data or record experiences for, for posterity. While observations in nature can assist with restoration and help us understand and reconcile our loss. Disasters can have first, second, and third order effects at the same time, recurring or at different times for different populations. The best and most useful application of citizen science may emerge in response to any of these. I believe that citizen science has strong ties to community engagement and, and civic participation. Its disaster response applications can be applied to second and third order effects that support the emergent psychosocial needs of the participating communities. I'm using the terms community science and citizen science interchangeably within this talk though for some there can be distinctions. Here are areas where I believe citizen science projects can have greater impact. Producing information with significance to the participant scientists. Teaching cultural norms and increasing civic participation. Creating trust within a community between unrelated individuals and between communities and industry or government. Elevating and increasing scientific learning through standards development increased definition, and common language. One hallmark of community science is that it occurs in many forms and in traditional spaces. Community participation in science is especially effective in spaces valuable to that community and may not look or be designed to work as part of academic research, instead being designed for cultural meaning. It's important to see science and traditional knowledge, no matter how that knowledge is described, and seek science in spaces valuable to the community. I am living on land once stewarded by the Ohlone, the first peoples of San Francisco and parts of the East Bay. Many communities practicing medicine, memory, and land guardianship and preservation as part of cultural heritage have collected lifetimes of location-specific information that if widely and responsibly adopted, are methods that can have an enormous effect on preventing wildfires that plague drought-affected California. This photo is of a group of Native peoples, along with non-Indigenous university students and locals around the town of Mariposa, California, who gathered for two days of controlled burns. The article this photo comes from describes how the Karuk and Yaruk tribes of Northern California have partnered with the Forest Service to manage land for traditional values 
and wildfire management. Similarly, Fire Sticks is a First Peoples cultural burning organization working in Australia with specific cultural and scientific knowledge. How does this fit with community science? Well, it has high community value, land management and fire prevention within highly culturally significant terms. It has high community participation. Individuals within communities are explicitly inscribed into these traditions. They share knowledge and have specific times and places to do this work. High scientific value. The effects of traditional fire management and land use can be observed and replicated. High trust. Traditions build trust. When conventional fire managements learn, incorporate, and respect native practices, there is better interaction between communities and government. It has low personal action. Parameters around how and who is taught these fire prevention methods mean that it's not the type of science that you can learn on YouTube or be applied without considerable knowledge and consent. In the past two years, I've been focusing on air quality monitoring, and an important issue for air quality monitoring is that communities have been burned by pseudo-participation. This happens when we're given the impression that we can affect change just by putting up a monitor, but we're locked out of the real empowerment of being able to reconfigure our roles with regards to the digital services we engage within. Pseudo-participation by design hurts the overall willingness to participate in projects or trust in government. In this case, full participation includes being the author of data rather than the subject of data collection. In other words, top-down closed organizations result in lost trust. The power of community science, both for communities and institutions, is that it builds trust from no trust. For SafeCast, community trust is built on a data platform, which is very different from some of the other community science expressions that I will also talk about. If we look at how SafeCast works, we're talking in terms of publicly held data assets. And how do publicly held data assets establish trust? Government data, commercially collected data, data collected for academic research, and industry-mandated data collection serve very specific purposes and are not 100% aligned with my or my community's needs. Although each type of data collector can serve an important role in our understanding of air quality, all data can be improved if there's transparency and standardization that allows that data to be used universally. On the left, we have a representation of a top-down, closed, push-style organization. Where monitoring happens, to what extent, or what data I get to see and freely use means that I have to rely on a provider for environmental data that I may need. Add proprietary algorithms and lack of standardization to the mix, and I may not be able to compare data between organizations even if I do have access. On the right, the first order of trust is data that I collect from myself. Within my community, I may not know the people or the motivations of any individual doing air quality monitoring, but I do trust data submitted by my monitor. Everyone who's opted in is determining, is determining the granularity of the data being gathered for my area. Other monitors are also reading particulate matter, and I can check the raw data files from their monitors. Trust isn't needed between community members because we're all participating willingly, using the same ground rules, and we all have access to raw data from the entire data set. But it also does something else. If we all have equal access to standardized, transparently collected, raw and open data, we can begin to have a conversation. Open data can also be used to verify other data sets, increasing the value for each. What's important to remember is that at any time we may lose access to any data set that is not put in the public domain. Let's examine a few other examples of people contributing their accumulated knowledge to the public good during or immediately after fires in California. Tyson Curtis lives in the Santa Cruz Mountains on land that's burned to the ground five times in 50 years. A professional in botanic design and an aloe enthusiast, 
Curtis made use of his expertise with these water guarding plants by writing an Allo Manifesto after he managed to save his home from the Basin fi Complex fire of 2008 using protective planting techniques. In the manifesto, Curtis writes, in the end, my experience with the Basin Complex fire was, in all honesty, anticlimactic. I still held my hose, but I hadn't even turned it on. My firefighter friend and I had a brief laugh at the absurdity of the Aloe Garden's effectiveness when we ran to help my neighbor, the one with the exploding propane tanks, who has since covered his entire hillside in aloes. Let's think of this in terms of citizen science. Curtis's knowledge and Allo Manifesto have high community value. He was able to save his home and help many others. There's high community interaction. Curtis is an Allo evangelist with many posts about his specific knowledge on his pig, pigfish Instagram site. There is an undetermined scientific value. We don't know yet what can come of this knowledge. There's a high level of trust with all of the documentation that Curtis has put out. And we know that there's been personal action since Curtis's neighbors followed suit. This is a satellite picture of the fires in Southern Washington, Oregon, and Northern California as they appeared on September 9th. Where I live in San Francisco is marked at the bottom with a yellow arrow. Daniel Swain, a climate scientist at UCLA, posted on Twitter that day, Extremely dense and tall smoke plumes from numerous large wildfires, some of which have been generating nocturnal pyrocumulonimbus clouds, fire thunderstorms, are almost completely blocking out the sun across some portions of California this morning. This photo was taken at 1 p.m. in the Mission District of San Francisco. That day, the internet was flooded with pictures like this as documentation of the doomsday. The trouble was that with all of our cameras are now built to brighten up dark images by moving the white balance. This was the unedited picture of the same scene. The photographer darkened the sky to better reflect what it actually looked and felt like to him. There are thousands of pictures like this that could be better used to understand what happened that day, but which image is more important, scientific and useful make us question how we view raw data collected from imperfect devices in its relationship to data edited to reflect memory and experience. In this relationship between raw and edited data, we must constantly clarify by what imperfect means the data was collected and by what self-selection, assumptions, or subjective transient and temporal experiences affect that data. Is this citizen science? Well, it has a high community value. People needed to share their experiences. It has a high community participation. Many posts, lots of public documentation. There's an undetermined scientific value. Not, a pl not replicable. Individual photos were not rigorously documented or questioned in their perspective or bias. Future benefits may evolve from having so many people document the day. Trust. Which image do you trust more, the lens that changed the white balance or the subjective filtering from the photographer? In terms of personal action, none can be taken, so there's a low personal action. When the skies cleared that day in the late afternoon, the air quality got significantly worse as the smoke that was high above San Francisco sank. Particulate increased dramatically, but the skies were clear, so everyone threw open their windows and doors. What you are seeing is a screenshot of the EPA particulate matter scale on a map of the San Francisco Peninsula, the North Bay and the East Bay, produced by a commercial sector company, Purple Air, the day after the people considered doomsday. Air quality stayed critical for several days in San Francisco and up and down the West Coast. San Francisco homes are notoriously drafty and poorly insulated. We live in pleasant band of cool temperate weather for most of the year, so it's rare to find air conditioning and people use their heaters only occasionally. That makes for poor preparations as I tape my windows, drape my doors with sheets, and try to make better seals around my doors with towels. I use this simple kit I purchased from public labs. The kit uses a Plantower 5003 sensor that I was originally 
that was originally developed for HVAC systems. These sensors are also used in safe cast monitors and commercial monitors, such as Purple Air from the last slide. I ran a number of tests. I wasn't interested in the data readouts or in keeping information. My purpose was to see if I could get the sensor to turn red to yellow to green, confirming fewer particulates in various places around my home. I placed the monitor at various distances from taped and untaped windows, determined how much time it takes for the air quality to improve while running the central fan after I placed and taped an MPR 1500 and MERV 11 filter, and how far away would the monitor remain green when using a commercial air filter designed to clear air in the room. My results. Window taping helped keep outdoor air from seeping in, but it's a pain when the outdoor, outdoor air suddenly gets better and I want to refresh my house. I taped vents and mail slots to varying effect. Every time I opened the outside door, the whole house went red. The greatest improvement was running the whole house fan after I taped the filter into place and ran the room filter on high for the room that I was in. Is this citizen science? While it has a high community value, I use technology developed in the public lab's open science discussion forums. A little bit of a low community participation. I did not publish or keep my results, but I did share my efforts and encourage other people to take tests of value to them. Low scientific value. I did not focus on replicability or add to a common standardized data set. High trust, though. I have faith in the information that I collected. I have high personal action. I was able to quickly act during an extreme event, and I made decisions that allowed me to act and relax. Where else are we finding citizen science? Well, social media, of course. The problem here is that there's as much misinformation as disinformation and value. Here we see the power of citizen science and social sharing as mainstream journalists are making DIY videos to respond to where people are asking questions, creating solutions, and testing the effects of homemade air purifiers. Does this fit the parameters for citizen science? Well, there's a high community value, lots of sharing, trusted sources are, adop are adopting methods of everyday people to communicate high community participation when DIY videos are openly publishing their results. There's a medium amount of scientific value. The experiments are meant to be replicated, but we don't know by, by what means that data is being collected. With social media posts, we have questions and concerns about unidentified base assumptions, differing materials, and the scientific rigor of the experiments. The information collected only builds to an actionable data set once a significant number of people add their verifiable results and can only be used in aggregate for research if the data is published using explicitly open copyright. Our question now, can communities that are documenting their air quality through the event of fires or any other disaster help reimagine what air quality might look like after the disaster. I hope you will actively participate in deciding how this is answered. Thank you.